Hello fellow scratchers. Have you ever wanted your projectiles in Scratch to have better physics, collisions, motion and bounce? This can be hard to get right, but keep watching and we'll cover everything you need to know in just one amazing episode. Let's begin by drawing a tank costume that can fire the ball projectiles. Make sure it's centred on the canvas by dragging it till it snaps in position. I'm adding a special invisible rectangle around the costume to avoid the unpleasant clipping that you get on the edge of the sprite. Name both the costume and the sprite Tank. Next, we'll create a level sprite. Using the rectangle tool to draw some nice borders all the way around the level, and a couple of other boxes to join in the fun. We need one more sprite now, we'll name Ball for the projectiles. I'm drawing a red circle. Hold down Shift whilst dragging to ensure it stays perfectly circular. Not too big now, anything around the 16 to 17 pixels or so will be good. Again, after drawing, select it and drag it to ensure it's perfectly centred. This is very important, so don't miss this step. OK, we'll begin with the tank scripts. I'm not going to do much here. We'll position the tank in the centre of the screen, and then forever loop, pointing at the mouse pointer. A second loop can listen for the mouse clicks and space key presses. These simply trigger a clone of the ball sprite to launch our projectile, and then wait for 0.2 seconds. This will prevent us shooting too fast if we hold down the fire button. Now to the ball sprite. We initially hide the original sprite. We'll let the clones do the actual work. When I start as a clone, move the bullet to the same position as the tank, and point towards the mouse pointer to get our direction of fire. Now, if we move the ball forward by 20 pixels, it should be located pretty much at the end of the tank's barrel. You might have to play with these values to get it right. And then show the new clone. If we run the project now and click the spacebar, we can check whether the position seems good or not. For me, the 20 pixels is spot on. However, we don't want the ball appearing in front of the tank. So if we go back to the tank sprite, I'll stick a go to front layer before the first forever loop. OK, back to the ball sprite. We need to set the projectile's initial velocity, that is, its speed in the x and y direction. Make two new variables, speed x and speed y, for this sprite only. And we'll set them to mouse x and y divided by 10. So the further the mouse is away from the centre of the screen, the faster the projectiles will travel in that direction. Then we add a repeat loop for 200 cycles. We don't want our balls to live forever. The main processing for the ball will be done in a new custom block we can name Tick, run without screen refresh. Stuff the Tick block into a repeat loop, and then after the loop, delete the ball clone. Nice. OK, the Tick custom block first wants to simply move the ball, so add a change x and change y by speed x and speed y respectively. A good point to test. Run the project and the balls fire out towards the mouse. Nice. What we should do next is stop them from travelling through the level walls. We check if the ball is touching the level. And if it is, simply delete the clone. We can test it again. Great, the balls no longer penetrate the level walls, but disappear instead. A good proof of concept, but not very impressive. We want to create balls that can bounce. Let's rearrange the script so that we can check the collisions after both the change x and change y independent of each other. This way of doing collision detection is perfect for levels that are only made up of vertical or horizontal walls without any slopes. And I use it a lot in my platformers. If a collision occurs due to us moving the x position, then we already know the bounce will be horizontal. And if we collide after moving the y, then it's going to be a vertical bounce. Calculating the bounce is therefore easy, we just negate the speed in the x or y direction. Now if we run the project, you can see that we have succeeded in creating some beautiful horizontal and vertical collisions. You may recognise these physics from games such as my Taco Burp game. Here, let's just add some gravity into the simulation. Change speed y by negative 0.5. And there! We have a super bouncy ball simulation. 
So why is this not the end of the video? Well, watch this. If we edit the level to include a curved surface and test again, now look at this. The balls should not be bouncing directly up off the curve like that. You see, as programmers, we often design our games to hide issues like this. So for example, in Taco Burp, I purposefully made no sloping platforms. This simplifies the taco collisions greatly, but in this tutorial, we're going to try to make things bounce way better. Right, this simplified movement collision scripts have to go. We'll start by putting it back to changing position X and Y. But then, when a collision occurs, rather than deleting the clone, we move the projectile out of the collision using a change by 0 minus speed x, and the same for speed y, like this. If I run the project, you can see the first problem we have to solve. After a ball collides, it is currently thrust back out of the level, leaving it floating quite far away from where it collided. We want to make the projectile end flush against the wall. To do this, we'll back the ball out of the collision more slowly by wrapping the change x and y in a repeat until not touching level. And then move the ball out a little at a time by multiplying speed x and speed y by negative 0.1. If we run the project, you can see that the bullets are now ending their flight flush up against the walls. That sets us up perfectly for our next step. Make a new block named find normal. And we'll make use of it down here under the tick script. Do you know what a surface normal is? If we draw a collision like this, then the normal of the collision is this red arrow pointing out perpendicular to the surface we have collided with. To be able to calculate how the ball will bounce, we are going to need to know what direction this normal arrow should point in. To do this, we will employ a little trick. Rather than checking for a collision with the ball itself, we sweep an offset ball costume around the first in a full circle checking for collisions. When we know where the surface begins and ends, we can take an average and that will be the surface normal. Duplicate the ball costume, naming it normal. I've renamed the original costume as ball. Then back in the normal costume, zoom out and with the ball selected, I will use the arrow keys to move it six pixels to the right by pressing the right arrow six times. Just make sure you are zoomed out when you do this. Now back in the scripts, under the define find normal, switch to the normal costume. We'd better also make sure to switch back to the ball costume at the top of the tick script. We need a new variable named dir dir for this sprite only to store the normal direction in. Set it to zero and point in the same direction of dir. Make a new custom block named rotate with a numeric input of by. In here we change dir by the input by and then point in the same direction, dir. Now it's important to check whether the first position in our circular sweep is already touching the level or not. If it is, then we need to locate the point where the collision starts. We repeatedly rotate until we are no longer touching the level, rotating right by 15 degrees as we go. Create a new variable named dir start to record the collision point for this sprite only. Set dir start to dir, but subtract 15. That was where the last collision occurred. Now for the case where we start sweeping and there is no collision, duplicate the loop, but modify it to repeat until we are touching level. Get rid of the knot. And we rotate counterclockwise by negative 15. When we have found the collision point, we record it in dir start as before, but don't negate it by 15 this time. Afterwards, we need to bring our sweep back to the top to prevent us rechecking the points we have already checked by setting dir to zero and pointing in direction dir. Move the script into the else here. Now all that's left is to sweep clockwise until we find the second collision surface. Duplicate this last loop script again, checking for a collision, 
but make the rotation B by positive 15. Once found, we can average the two directions by setting der to der plus der start, all divided by two. Let's test this works by first ensuring the ball sprite is visible and that we are using the ball costume. Then drag the sprite on the stage to right next to a wall and click on the find normal script to run it. You can see it sweeping around first left and then right before reporting a dir of 45 degrees. That's quite correct. Brilliant. So now we have the normal vector. We will create a new custom block named bounce to calculate the correct bounce off the collision surface. Include two numeric inputs, nx and ny, standing for normal x and normal y. Make it run without screen refresh. We can make use of the bounce block right after finding the normal. We just need to convert the normal direction, der, into a normal vector using sine of der and cosine of der. Simple. OK, now for some rather magical maths. Let me draw you a diagram. We have a speed x and speed y represented here with the blue arrow. The red arrow is the normal vector that we calculated and is represented by nx and ny. It points directly away from the collision surface. The purple arrow shows the speed we want to calculate after the collision. Now this bit I looked up on Google. <laughs> we can calculate the dot product of the speed and normal vectors like this. And the new vector can be calculated using this from the tail of the speed x and y to the collision wall. Now why is this super awesome? Because if you now rearrange these vectors to line up here like this, we can see that the new green arrow, if doubled, allows us to calculate the correct speed vector after the collision. That's pretty awesome and a little mind boggling, but let's just go with it and put it into action. Create a new variable named dot product and set it to speed x multiplied by nx plus speed y multiplied by ny. And then we change speed x by minus two, multiplied by nx, multiplied by dot product, and the same for speed y, but with ny instead of nx. Cool, that's all the maths done already. Now come back to the define tick and make sure to set our sprites costume back to the ball costume after calculating the bounce. This is an exciting moment. We can run the project and see what we have got. Oh my word, it's a miracle. The balls are actually bouncing pretty much in the directions you'd expect. It's amazing what a little dot product maths can do. But hold on there. There seems to be a little bit of an error in the bounce right here. See how the ball is bouncing off to the right. I'd expect it to be coming right back down at me. It actually took me quite a while to track this one down. Here's me using say blocks to show the normal directions. I'd expect them to say 180 when colliding with the ceiling, but they are reporting 172. Hmm, okay, if we go into the ball costumes and select the normal costume, all we need to do is resize the ball by about half. And when you do this, Hold down the ALT key, A-L-T, the ALT key, before you start dragging. This causes the resize to occur from the middle of the circle, not the edge. Very important. Now this improves the precision of the circular sweep quite a bit, as the larger circle was colliding with the floor too early. Testing again shows the collisions are now reported as 180, as expected. So I can remove the debug and we can continue. Let's add back in the gravity to our simulation. Oh yes, this is very satisfying. The only thing missing is that the balls are exceedingly bouncy. Now why is this? Well, it's because our collision maths are absolutely perfect. There is no loss of energy from these bounces in the form of friction. And luckily, this is really easy to add in. Find our define bounce block. And we'll change the minus two values here 
a value of minus 2 means a perfect bounce. And minus 1 would deliver no bounce at all. We'll pick a number in between. Minus 1.6. Now look at this. The balls are quite visibly losing speed now on collision. But you can see too that this has caused some quirks, where the balls are appearing to stall and stop moving. This occurs because sprite collisions are never perfect. We need to ensure we allow for a little error by moving the ball away from the collision surface just a bit to prevent them getting stuck. Durr is already pointing away from the surface. We'll move the sprite gradually in that direction using a repeat 10, and within it we'll move the ball by half a pixel by sin of Durr and cos of Durr. Then stop the script when we detect no collision. We do it this way, so that the loop will always run once through, even if it originally would not detect a collision. In the unlikely event of not being free from the surface after 10 repeats, we delete the clone. Running the project now, and oh nice, we've got a much more stable simulation. The balls are no longer sticking to the surface. Now, just a few more tweaks to finish this project off. We can fade out the balls, instead of just deleting them when they time out. Duplicate the main repeat loop and make a second short loop of 20. That also changes ghost effect by 5. Now let's make the level a little bit more exciting. Try whatever you want. This is the really fun part of making projects like this. I love how the balls are naturally rolling down the slopes. Isn't physics great? But ah, we've hit an issue. You see my simulation has suddenly slowed down to a crawl. Oh, mega lag. And look, I can see the culprit right there. That sprite is stuck in a wall in an endless loop. In theory, this should not happen. But sadly, as I said, costume-based collisions in Scratch are not perfect. Let's protect ourselves from this happening by making our repeat loops more robust. Locate the define find normal script. This has the potential not to end if it doesn't ever escape from the level collision. We can fix it by adding an if to the define rotate block and check if the absolute value abs of dir is larger than 720. That's two full rotations. Then simply delete this clone. There's one other loop in the define tick script that is worth fixing too. Make a new variable named count to keep track of the loops for this sprite only. Initialize it to zero and change it by one each time around the loop. Check if count gets larger than 20 and then we again delete this clone. Now if I were you, I'd like to add in some code to make the player's tank movable. That would be super fun, but I think I'll leave that to you. However, to allow us to test out firing from different locations, I'm going to set the tank's sprite as draggable with this block from the sensing category. Then in the ball sprite, because we are no longer launching balls from the center of the screen, we update the ball launching script to offset by the start position X and Y of the projectile. And that is it. We can run the project full screen and drag the tank around. I really love how the balls roll around in the dish shape I made to the right. That is very satisfying. So to round it all off, let's just look back over the scripts to see what can change to make this project your own. Firstly, the projectile velocity, that's how fast the bullets travel through the air, is set here in the ball sprite. It is dependent on how far your mouse is from the tank. But we could, for example, change it like this to give a constant speed in the direction of the mouse. A value of 14 is quite fast, but 8 would give us much slower bullets. We can play with gravity too. Just change speed y here. 0, for example, turns gravity right off. Then there's ball bounciness. Scroll to the define bounce script and see the number minus 1.6. 
And remember, values can range from minus 2 for complete bounciness down to minus 1 for no bounce at all. And lastly, in the tank sprite, we can change the fire rate by modifying this number. A smaller number makes the tank fire faster. Like this. And that, folks, is a wrap. I know what you'll be asking for next. What about ball to ball collisions? And man, yes, that would be really cool, but it also is a whole other level of scripting and would get complicated very quick. Definitely a tutorial for another time. What I think you should try next is developing the player movements and then adding in objects to be shot at. Wouldn't it be cool to add other players too? Do you think you could give it a go? Well, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you have, then please do smash the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to avoid missing my next exciting video. Leave me comments to let me know how you've got on and don't worry about posting your project IDs here too if you want. But until next time, thanks for watching and scratch on guys. Bye.